Well, it's with the greatest pleasure that we welcome Alcides Rodriguez to the festival. And uh, uh, we have an interesting improvisation. The words of the pizza were improvised because Alcides' solo is standing up, which is very unusual for bass clarinet. But after you hear him play, you'll know why. So we have invented a peg here. So I, I, have a, I have a special peg that I have made for when, it's, when I play standing up because usually this, uh, you know, this is too thin and it's too tiny. What was a lot. So I actually got a, a thicker rod, uh, like a three quarters of an inch, and, uh, and then I had a machine that's just doing this part for me so I can put it so that doesn't move. I didn't bring it with me, so I'm going to play with some marks here. Well, by now there's a lot of stuff. I, I see more and more pieces written for the bass man, but I keep playing this piece just because I like it. Uh, this, is, this piece is called the Andante and Gerard Rondo by Weber. And it's actually, uh, it was originally written for viola, the viola of his brother. And, uh, and he was uh, one of his best friends of Basunis, so he actually did transcribe it for Basunis. So well, this piece is more, you know, it's known for a piece for Basunis. But then, uh, you know, when I was uh, in college, you know, for my graduate, graduate recital, I wanted to play something bass band. So basically, this is exactly the bassoon part that is transposed for the bass menu. And I, uh, I changed a couple of things, you know, articulation wise, that, you know, that, that I like better, you know, but it's just my way. Yeah, but this is the Weber and Dante and the Gerber. And, uh, you know, as, as most of you know, we just we just rehearsed this piece. So he, he found out that I was playing this last night. So we just went through it. So let's see how it goes. <laughs>
Just to start, uh, I think it's a great, it's a fun instrument to play. Uh, one of the tricky things about the bass clarinet is that most people get frustrated about the bass clarinet is because it, it, it gets out of adjustment really, really easily. And uh, it's actually more delicate than the clarinet. So it's really hard to find, you know, if, if the bass clarinet is not very well adjusted, it doesn't respond well. And that's pretty much, you know, the, the, you know, the main reason most students just get frustrated. Oh, the bass clarinet, I don't like it because it's just hard to play. And it's just because most of the time it's just, they are just out of adjustment. So it's very important to have a really good, uh, very good, very well adjusted instrument. So, uh, but it's, it's, it's fun. I, I love playing the bass clarinet. So, any questions you guys uh, want to ask me about? Bass clarinet. If not, I, if not, I just keep talking. Yes. Do you have any tips for uh, making that middle range the, you know, that's, that uh, it's always tough? Uh, the, the yeah, yeah, this. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, that's what I'm, um, you know, one of the, th my, my tips is, you know, I always found out that usually these notes get really hard you know, after the D, and it's mostly uh, because there is always something leaking on the register key. Uh, something is all not, not covering right. Of course, you know, um, some of the, some of the, uh, the student model bass clarinets or, or um, the more simplified instruments, it's, it's, we're always going to have to deal with the, uh, with, uh, with the register key. It's just, it's just awkward. It just doesn't respond well ever. And uh, but if you you know in, in an instrument that um, that you don't have many many options, uh, I would just recommend. I mean, sometimes you can play around with the neck. You know, like as you guys can see, I have a, a copper plated neck now, and this responds a lot better than than the silver plated. Um, the difference is incredible, and, and this actually helps especially on those high notes, you know. So I can play more like. Almost effortless with this neck. Uh, you know, and if I put my, my original neck, it, the difference is great. It almost feels like a, uh, you know, a, it's a lot of resistance. But, you know, my, the, the, to answer to your question, it's just, you know, just experiment a lot with uh, maybe different mouthpieces and, and reads, you know. Sometimes, also on the bass line, you always are going to need a, a, a softer read, you know, for the, for the high register. It, if you have a, a read that is a little bit too, you know, too heavy on the, on the tip, it's going to make the high register a lot uh, harder. Yeah, it has, you know, yeah, it has a lot to do with, uh, more with equipment, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? 
Yes? You know, that's a, that's a very, very good question. Um, my approach is I don't change anything. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a bigger instrument and I just blow more air. That's all. I mean, it's not completely, you know, 100% true, but uh, in terms of how you blow into the instrument, my approach on the bass is that it should feel exactly like it feels uh, on the clarinet. You know, articulation-wise, I mean, you should apply the same principles. Um, if, you, if you look at it, you know, on, on this, one of the things I love about this next is it's, it's as close as, you know, the 45-degree angle we need, you know, to play clarinet. And in some ways, you know, if I, if I put my clarinet here, I, I would like to think that I have the same angle as I was playing uh, clarinet. So usually when I play in the orchestra, I, I, I bring a little bit more towards the back. So I, I'm, I always feel, I always sit like with, with a, f a foot in front of me so I can actually balance my body, I'm almost always leaning forward. So I actually use that. That's, what, that's why you guys see me pl uh, sitting in, in this bench. And yesterday I was, you know, during the, the octet, I was sitting in a, in a higher bench because I, I always try to be higher so I can actually lean forward so I can have a better angle here. So because I like to feel exactly as in the clarinet. And uh, it's just, you know, it's just bigger. You just take a little bit more mouthpiece. Uh, but um, in terms of how you blow into an instrument, it should feel the same as on the clarinet. Uh, and, and this is a very in important subject because uh, in the past, you know, bass clarinetists were just bass clarinetists. You know, they were, they, they barely play clarinet. Nowadays, that's not the case. Nowadays, you have to be able to play both instruments really well, especially if you want to win an audition on bass clarinet. It's not just bass clarinet. You have to go and play the Mozart concerto. You have to play excerpts in clarinet. So you have to be in, in, in great shape on both instruments. So for me, that's, you know, it's searching. I've been searching more and more for that. And uh, I want to feel as comfortable and as, as, you know, as similar as possible between both instruments. I want to be able to play bass clarinet and go back to B flat and, and, and only feel like a difference in the mouthpiece. But no, I, I'm not changing air. I'm not changing the way I articulate. I'm not changing, you know, anything. It's just different. There are a couple things, uh, for example, that they are just obvious because of an instrument. For example, on the bass clan, when you have this, how, I mean, how would you go from top to bottom? That, on the bass clan, that you have to change. You have to make a couple changes. On the clan, you don't need to do that. On the clan, you can just go up and down without moving much here. But on the bass clarinet, I always feel that you have to reset your embouchure. Okay, not necessarily change it, just reset it. So if I do like in a slow motion, I go. So in some ways, I, it's not that I just go. Because otherwise you get the, the, the high partials. So I just go. Cut the air and readjust my embouchure back again, and then I play the low note. So. And sometimes, the more you practice it, you get used to do it fast. So like in this piece I was playing. You always run the risk of squeaking if you don't, if you don't readjust. So I go. And then I can just nail that the, the low note. Yeah, that's the answer to your question. Yes. Okay, great. Any anybody else? Another question. Anything you know, like anything? Yes. What is your favorite excerpt to play? My favorite excerpt. Uh, well, you know, uh, my you know the Cacciatore Piano Concerto is one of is you know that's one of the standards. Uh, I, ha I actually been fortunate enough to play it with, with an because that piece almost never gets played. Uh, we played with Atlanta Symphony uh, last two years ago, and you know they usually do um, 
in the program, they print out you know when when the when the piece was played last time, who was the conductor. The piece uh, hasn't been played in Atlanta since uh, for the last thirty years or so, so never you know haven't been played. So it's, I just felt really fortunate. I, I finally got to play that excerpt because it's one of the things that you practice over and over and over. Never play. Another another excerpt that um, I haven't played. Uh, you know the Grand Canyon. Everybody knows the Grand Canyon for the bass line. You know. I had never played with orchestra. I had, you know, never played. Uh, I have played Rider Spring. Uh, another one that is really cool is the, the Shostakovich, uh, Shostakovich Violin Concerto. Do you guys know that one? I, I haven't been able to play it either. So it's all these things, you know, we just practice over and over and over, and they are called the standards, but standard for the bass line and not necessarily for the orchestra. Uh, yeah, but, you know, like, those are my favorite exes, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, Shostakovich Seventh is a really nice excerpt, you know. Yeah, yeah. Any another question? Yeah. Uh, to go off the adjustment thing, do you do your own adjustment, or do you take it to somebody? And how many times do you do it a year to keep it? Uh, you know, I actually, you know, and not everybody is like this, but I actually do a lot of adjustments on my bass clarinet. I mean, I have I have someone that works for me. Uh, but you know, every time I get to see him, and you know, I just he he does some adjustment. But I actually do my own adjustments, you know. Like, so I I tweak a lot of things on my instruments, you know. And 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 and, and I think that's a small, probably five percent of people that do that. <laughs> try no try and error. I, I I just started doing that since I was you know maybe twelve years old. I remember the the first time I put my clarinet apart. I just put it apart, and I was you know I put the keys all in order. And then I put it back together, you know, going back in the order. And then since then, I've just been doing this, this the whole thing. Now, now I don't have to do that. I mean, now I put it apart, you know, but I, I change pads. I, and I, I do a lot of things that, um, for example, the, um, the key tension. I, I, I like a certain way, so I just, I tweak that. You know, I, I tweak the springs, you know, so I get to a key to, to, this, to the tension I like. I, I mean, I'm not going to wait for, for, to go to a repairman to, to make my client feel like I want it. I just try to do as much as I can. I, I you know, I, I change, you know, the corks and, you know, to adjustments. And uh, the only thing I don't do is change pads, you know, because that's a little bit more complicated, you know, like, you know, trying to sit it right. But I do a lot of adjustments to my clients. Yeah. And that's something very important, you know, that, um, I mean, just try, you know, like just move, you know, especially on the baseline, just move on screw and see what it does, what it does. Uh, because, um, it's, uh, it's sometimes kind of silly, you know, how people won't play one instrument just because, oh, it doesn't work. And it's just like you just need to move one little thing and it's just, it works. Yeah. Question? Yeah. Yeah, you, just, you, know, you know, the, string, the, the springs are kind of bent. So I mean, if you want more tension, you want to you have, you want to bend it a little bit more. If you want less tension, you want to put it back. But you have to be really careful. I mean, that's something that you know, because uh, the spring is, is attached to the to the post. You you have to make sure you you use two uh, tools. You have to use a screwdriver and maybe in, in a second screwdriver to kind of hold it when you once you bend it. So you don't you don't want to bend it from the from the post because it can just break. And then you're screwed. <laughs> Okay, you know, so you don't want to bend it from the post. You have to, you want to kind of grab it somewhere and then just bend from there. It's tricky, but you know, you have to run the risk. If you're, if you're ever going to do it, make sure that you, you, you know, you, there is a repairman close to where you are. So, so in case you have to run to, you know, to them so they can fix it. Um, Yeah, it could be taking the mechanism apart, or it could be that, um, I mean, especially in this key, you know, sometimes you need a little bit of space. I don't know if, how many of you, are, you know, know the bass line very well, but in this key, for example, you need a little bit of space. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, it may be that it's just something is touching and, and almost like a really hard to see with the eye. So that's why sometimes you, you can use cigarette paper to test it. Uh, and the, the, the best thing to do is, you know, for example, if I want to see if something is affecting me, I just move the neck. So th this is by itself. I isolate it and see how it works with uh, this. And then I put it back, and if it squeaks, okay, then I think that there is too much stuff here. So I can just shave this down a little bit. 
So it's just, you know, a lot of, you know, trying and stuff. And it, it works. Yes? You know, no that I know of, you know, like, no. Um, I think, you know, the best thing to do is just experiment, you know, like we, when, when something is wrong, just experiment and see what, you know, one of the things is just feeling, feeling it whether the kids are sitting, that's, you know, one, one way to tell whether there is leaks or not. Or you can also always test it with a, with a little bit. Everybody has seen how uh, repair people, they test it with a, a piece of uh, cigarette paper. That's how they can tell whether the, the, uh, the pad is leaking or not. But sometimes, you know, especially in the baseline, it's more about the little screws and how things are adjusted. Yeah. Uh, yes? Favorite, <laughs> that's the thing. The, the, there is not a lot of things for baseline. And, I, you know, because, you know, I, I'm mainly focused on the orchestra and, uh, so, and I actually haven't researched as much. And I know there is a lot of new pieces. I was looking at, uh, um, you know, the, the, the sheet music they had in the, in the uh, ex exhibition room. And I actually found a couple new pieces for bass clients, so I bought them because I need, I need to start playing something different. But um, the other piece that I always play uh, that is, I think is a lot of fun is the, the Tansman Sonatine, which is, you know, it's for bassoon. But it works amazing. It works perfectly on the bass clarinet. And... Um, there are a couple pieces, you know, for example, like the, the, the Schumann Romances, they work right on the bass clarinet, because, uh, you know, they're written for cello, too. So, and, uh, in, you know, in terms of what, what to practice on the bass clarinet, again, same thing, you know, I, um, I do the rose etudes, you know, I, I do technical etudes, I do the scales. I mean, like I said earlier, I just try to approach it exactly like, a, like a, what I do on the clarinet. Um, one, th one important thing about the bass, um, just, just talking about technical things. Uh, of course, you have the low, the low notes, you know, that you play, you use your thumbs a little bit more. But for example, for the high register, you know, after C, you know that the bass clarinet has on this key, on the, on the, the index, it has a little hole here. Does anybody know what that hole is for? Yeah. So basically, like in the client, you know, when we play D, we, we, we keep this finger up, you know, open. But on the bass line, we have to keep it down. And that was, that's what the, we have to play in the small, in the small uh, edge, you know. So that's, that's what that little hole is. So you play. If you don't close that, it doesn't work. But I actually almost never use those notes. Okay, on the bass clarinet, for the most part, you're gonna use the overblown notes. Like, like on the clarinet. Now, C, C sharp, open. No, C sharp like an F sharp, D, D sharp or E flat, E, at least in the buffet bass clarinet, they are in tune. The F, if you play the F like a B flat, it's always going to be flat. So I have to figure out all the things. So what I, what I do, I play the F. Like in the long F on the, on the clarinet, everybody knows the long F. So if you play long F, it's going to be super sharp. So what I do, I add, you know, so I, I experiment a lot, adding keys. How do I do to, you know, to find that, the right pitch, you know, and you, you can use the tuner too. So it's like a long F, but I, I add the C sharp key, so that brings it. So and I have gotten used to use, use those, those fingerings. So I, I almost, seriously, almost never use the regular D and C sharp D um, or E flat. I almost I always use those, uh, those overblown notes. Uh, sometimes when, when I have to play softer, so for example, for the D,
you don't want it to drop. So what I do is I add the register key, but without, without the thumb. But it's sharp. But you can actually bring it down. You, know, you, you can just change the color by just bringing it down. And, and, then, and then I realize, OK, maybe it's still too sharp. So I just add an extra finger. What finger do I add? So I just experiment. So So you can do one, you can do two. So in this piece, when I play, and I don't have, I'm, I'm not thinking, I'm not, I'm not freaking out because in, that the noise on a drop, because I want to play really soft, you know, so I can go as soft as I can. And sometimes I play the C sharp like that too. I add the, the, just a register key. So, that's the, so those are the kind of tricky things that you kind of have to get used on the bass line. And, uh, but for the most part, you use, use the, the, uh, the overblown notes. OK? So um, just one, one more question. Any, anybody have one more question before we, we close? Yes? Sorry. You know, one of the things, you know, preparing for auditions is, you know, besides knowing the excerpt very well, uh, it's just you have to have a lot of discipline. And, uh, you know, record yourself. Rhythm is, is one thing that is super important. You know, just, you know, don't just play an excerpt, you know, you know just by, by heart. You have to make sure that the, the rhythm is really good. Uh, so I would re highly recommend that when you, first you have to record yourself yourself playing the excerpts. And when you listen back, just listen for the rhythm, intonation, and, and sound. So that's, that's one of the things that I do a lot when I prepare for auditions. Just record myself, listen back, and just judge you know, from, from that. OK? That's a, that's a very long question, so we need more, more time. But I mean, that's you know, just to answer really quick. So um, it's been a pleasure to be here. And uh, I, it's, it's a little bit of, you know, we need, we need to stop here. but. Uh, I'll be glad to talk to anyone that you know wants to talk to me a little bit later or you know during the reception um, about anything. So uh, thank you for being here, and I, um, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks. <laughs>